Rich, I guess I'll start saying his name. I hate to broadcast pastors because they some some of them like it, some of them don't, some of them are less. I don't. It's just I don't call pastors like pastor so and so. I just call them their name because to me they're just bros, you know. They're just people that just like you and I. But anyways, Rich last night was teaching and. Um, I really enjoyed one of the things that he was saying. Well, I enjoyed all of it, first of all. You know, it's kind of unusual because I don't often enjoy everything that a pastor has to say. But since I've been going to this church, oh, I don't know, maybe nine meetings now or something, nine, nine times, you know, at least for a month and a half, you know, going Sundays and then going Sundays and Wednesdays. You know, there's nothing I disagree with. I mean, that's unusual because, you know, Anybody that knows me knows I can find something wrong with everybody. Now, I don't mean the person. I meant with teachings. You know, a lot of times people will choose to risk it or stick their neck out in Scripture someplace. And believe me, I'll chop it off. <laughs> Been around a while. <laughs> but anyways, one of the things that I enjoyed last night was the talking of wasting time. You know, was that... We were talking about from the book of Revelation about who was and is and is to come and how God exists, you know, and where he is and how he is, the way he is, and such as he is, and that before time and through time and by time, and he created time, so obviously he exists outside of time, and as such we exist inside of time because we were created in time. You know, and I enjoyed it, but one of the things that I also enjoyed was, you know, the personal touch, the personal insight into the the man himself, you know, where one one little kind of humorous note was that, you know, he said he hates to waste time and that, you know, he'll open up a cabinet and look at it and say, you know, well, you know, I want to get something to eat or I'm hungry, so he looks at something, you know, and says, you know, he'll eat something that he doesn't like, you know, look for something he likes, but, you know, eat something he doesn't like, and they'll say, well, you know, you can cook this, and he says, no, I'll just eat this, you know, instead. And it's so typical of most of men and me, you know, especially, yeah, you know, I'll look inside, you know, I'll go, eh, you know, eat that instead. And if I can't eat something, I know how to cook, you know, so I'll cook something up, you know. But my first reaction is if I look in the, the, the pantry, you know, so to speak, or the closet or the cabinet, wherever you keep your food, then I'll look for something to eat that I can snack on, you know. And I'll just snack and I'll eat it, you know. I see it, I eat it. Because... <laughs> In the ministry, lots of times when you're sharing the Word of God, you get hungry afterwards. You don't get hungry during, but, well, maybe some do. I don't know. I don't. But afterwards, you kind of like, boom, and you're suddenly hungry. So you, you see it, you eat it. And so I kind of appreciated that little insight of, like, you know, reaching for something, you know, eating whatever it is, you know. Believe me, I've eaten lots of junk, you know, pop open a can and just eat it and scarf it. But, you know, rather than take the time to, you know, get involved in cooking and everything else. But I've noticed a lot of people on the internet. See, I'm, I'm based on the internet. My ministry's on the internet. I used to think, well, you know, because I've gone and I've, I've given, <laughs> I'll start to say speeches. I've given teachings, I've taught, I've, I've been a speaker, I've given lessons, I've given, you know, different things in different ministries at different times. And while I have that gift or ability or anointing, you could say, to teach or to preach, you know, because really what most people are doing aren't teaching, they're preaching because they're not interrelating. They're more talking at you than talking with you. And that's what preaching is. Preaching is talking at you. And then the implications in the evangelical world is this whole idea in theology that somehow if I communicate talking at you because I prayed for you to have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit of God would say to you that the Spirit of God will teach you. So it's not the person who's preaching, but the Spirit of God that's teaching you and you get out of it what you get out of it. You know, and, you know, to a certain degree that's true, but it would have been nice if we would have admitted way back when that we're not teaching, we're preaching. You know, it's just kind of like one of those things. But you see, preaching had a bad connotation because preaching was associated in the Jesus movement as those preachers who were like, oh, hellfire brimstone. I mean, you know, kind of like going to heaven or going to hell. You know, kind of like a Billy Graham, only more like a Billy Sunday. You know, hanging over the fire with a string by a string, and I'm going to cut it. You know, well, 
you know, you, you get kind of a mix, you know. And I've been in areas and arenas of Christendom where there is teaching going on. There are teaching ministries. There are home Bible studies that are sometimes designed as teaching ministries, and those are teachers and teaching. Giving a lecture is not teaching, in my personal opinion. Now, I know Western civilization and Western culture has the oratorium, you know, of this idea of propagating the lectern and the lecture as being the recipient of somehow knowledge without there being interaction. Well, you know, I'm, that's Western culture. You know, I study some Eastern culture, <laughs> kind of like the Jewish way, <laughs> kind of like you interrelate, but that's the way it is. So, I've noticed that on the internet, especially with a lot of people that are already saved, they want to waste time rather than make time. You know, I like to make time profitable. I like to bear fruit. I like to see things that are going to last, that are going to accomplish something. I don't like to waste my time. In other words, I don't like to just, you know, babble for the sake of babbling. I don't sit down and say, oh, well, you know what, I think I'll just, you know, walk out there, you know, and flip on a camera and I'll just start babbling about whatever, you know, and, you know, me personally, that's a waste of my time, you know, I have more important things to do with my time, I feel, than to spend it wasting time battling. I'd rather, you know, investigate what God has to say to me and get to know Him in a more personal, ultimate way and to relate to Him in my day to see what He has in store for me each and every day as I live my life out by examining those things that are around me, the circumstances, the creative process that God has created the world and the universe in, and then also those things with which God is able to arrange the circumstances of my life to bring about a revelation of Himself. So I'm looking forward to using the time profitably to redeem the time specifically so that it's used for a directional purpose as opposed to a objectionable, questionable rationale. And a lot of people, unfortunately, that I'm running into lately really want to distract rather than attract, you know, any type of response to what they're saying or what they're doing. They just want to babble. They just want to, you know, kind of like just shoot it off, talk about it, and, you know, maybe even be in error or in worse than that, mislead people by what they're saying or what they're posting or what they're revealing or sometimes, sadly, what they're commenting on and discussing on a regular basis over and over again, kind of repeating the same mistakes of just wasting time, really. And, you know, I admit there's a certain amount of what we call fellowship that goes on, you know, and some people, you know, they need the superficial conversation in order to get to the heart of their matters, or sometimes they communicate on superficial levels. I don't. I like to deal directly objectively to the issue or to the person with specifics of what I'm talking about, with the reality of who Jesus is, with the confidence that God is at work both to do its will of his good pleasure in me and in you. So what's going on with you? You know, I don't want to hear about, you know, your job and your this, that and the other thing, unless you're telling me that God is in your job and you're doing something, you know, that you're talking about, that God showed you something while you're at your work, you know. Because in my personal opinion, and this is more backed up by Scripture too, and I can share with you sometime if you ever come over, but your job is just to pay for what you're doing with the Lord. Not really about, you know, that's who you are. Your identity is not your job. I'm sorry, no matter how much you may love your job, get excited by your job, be involved in the mammon of this world, or the money, or whichever way you want to look at it, mammon is really the manifestation of that which is man-made. That's what mammon is. You know, we like to point to and identify it Greek-wise to say it's of the monetary system and, you know, maybe free enterprise and that kind of thing. But no, it's really man-made. If you want to change mammon to man-made, you got it. You know, whatever initiated or originated in man, you got mammon. That's it. And so, you know, working in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but Putting yourself and your identity into your work is a wrong application of what God intended for you to do. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Go out. You know, enjoy. Hey, I've, I provided. You know, I've given you a means with which you can be provided for your health, your wealth, your prosperity, your 
feeding, your necessities. I'm the Lord God provider. I will take care of you. The birds have nests. The the yeah, the birds have nests. <laughs> you know, the foul of the air, the word. But anyways, the birds have nests. You know that. The lilies of the fields, you know, they've never been so dressed in such a better way than what God has already intended for them to do, and they grow up into that and become beautiful. If you've ever looked at lilies of the field, and you look outside and you see this giant, vast array of how God has or, or ordered a wildflower to grow in the midst of a field, and you go, wow, that's beautiful, Lord. And if he's done so in dressing the field and in so providing the nest and birds to eat and to be and have a, a nesting place, then likewise... Jesus said that our Father in Heaven would take care of us. And in so saying those things, He wanted us to identify that which God is doing. He wanted us to realize and recognize behind the scenes of what we've made obscene by putting man in front of the scenes is God is at work, always. And that's what you should be focusing in on. You shouldn't be wasting time with what is on the superficial but rather be making time and redeeming the time of what's underneath the superficial that's at work to do something maybe beyond what is temporal or temporary, like your job or your, your vocation or your avocation, but what is eternal, those things that are the kingdom of God, people, places, you know, things that God has sent you to do, that wants you to do, to accomplish, to learn, to be a part of, to enjoy and be that entity of himself in this world as you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. Don't waste the time that you have living on this earth to just simply babble and scrabble and you know play games and you know do this, that and the other thing and you know I'm not saying don't enjoy life, but make sure that your life is more than just eat, drink and be merry. Make sure it's more than just you know, an avocation of some declaration that you said way back when and you didn't involve God in it since then. Your life was meant to be abundantly full of God in it. That it was obvious that God is in you, that God is with you, that God is for you, and that God is taking care of you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them, that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. After that you have received, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, you. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed, whom having not yet seen, you love, in whom, though you yet see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. We walk by faith and not by sight. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. At times, in times, when I do the work of the ministry on the internet, you know, I take the time to investigate, to relate, to see that which is being posted. A person will post some statement or some false picture or some false teaching. And I'll go to their website, you know, and I'll go to their, their profile page, if it's Facebook, or whatever it may be, and I'll, I'll look behind the scenes of what, what are they really talking about? What are they really relating about? How are they, how are they presenting Jesus? You know, what are they really talking to and addressing? I mean, is this something that needs to be commented on? Is this something that needs to be stated because people are reading this? Thousands of people are reading this? You know, even in the possibility that there might be millions reading it? I look at it as being, hey, you know, if that's what I'm called to do, then I should follow through with what God has told me to do. And that's what I choose to do on the internet ministry that I have. I don't just record videos and post them and, you know, record or to post um, aggregate ministry devotionals from a bunch of different ministries. Aggregate means to put them all together and present them and to give them to people and to, you know, 
highlight them in such a way that the people are paying attention to them and reading them. But I also comment, you know, that the third part of that ministry of what God has given me to do in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the Spirit of God causing truth to be made manifest. That when I see things that are wrong, I just state false. If a person wants to comment farther, I'll explain to them why it's false. But I want the reader to know that, hey, this is not truth. This is not accurate. This is something that's been rearranged, changed, or in some way false because I did do the research. I did look it up. I have followed up. I do this daily. And I spend the time, the quality time, to pray about, to walk forward with, and to allow the Holy Spirit to give me the words to say and to follow through with what they are. Sometimes they may not be the best choices that I may make. But at most opportune times, people are touched by the fact that the reality of what they may not have known is now made known. They suddenly click and go, oh, you know you're right, that isn't true, or that is false, or I shouldn't be posting that, or I shouldn't be doing that. Maybe it's not a good idea to post some dog getting slaughtered. Maybe it's not a good idea to you know show children on the internet you know being whatever. Maybe it's something I shouldn't be doing, and now that someone has said something, I feel like maybe I need to take this down or to remove it. And so they do. And that's one of the beauties of, though it may seem as though, you know, the, the one choice that I make to comment false may be at some point in time challenging to some, and some may misread that and misunderstand that. Little do they see behind the scenes going the extra mile to prove it's false. I mean, God has used that to give me the confidence and the faith to move forward in that ministry, to always be able to discern and to seek out the wisdom in James 1.5 to know what the answer is for those particular reasons why a person may be doing what they're doing when they're posting false material. Lots of things, you know, I just don't have them. You know, I don't see them. I choose not to participate in that wrong direction. But those people that have chosen to follow Jesus, they really want to know Him in a personal intimate way, that really trust in the Lord as well as what God has shown me or revealed to me in order to, to maybe further develop their personal relationship, then yeah, I have that responsibility to them. I have that accountability to be responsible about the things that I post as well as the things that I see. Because if I see that it's wrong, I can't just say, oh, well, too bad, let it go. No, I have to say something. Because to remain silent is to participate in a lie, and the spirit of a lie comes upon you. And whether you know it or not, an internet ministry has more of what's unseen coming through that monitor to you and affecting your soul through your mind because of the instant input device that your eyes are, that Jesus warned you about, that you need to be careful. You know, for me, it wearies my soul sometimes, the distractions and the abstractions that people will put out there, that I have to be backed up. And God says, hey, stop for a while, pray. Spend some quality time in the Word or in prayer or in some other way from being so caught up in the spirit of error or the spirit of a lie or the deceptive practices that do happen on the Internet style of ministry that God has given me to be a part of but happens all the time in social media, much less Facebook or Twitter or or websites or web development or in any other presentation, vid, YouTube, Vimeo, Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O, um, you a stream or any other of those venues with which they are overtly, directly affecting people's souls because they have a bombardment effect that we know television has done the same thing and now it's more so on the internet because even that much concentration on being in that type of environment really goes directly inside you and Jesus said whoa be careful how great is the light if your eye be full of light how great the light within but if your eye be full of darkness if you're looking at the dark side and participating therein how great is the darkness within and that's why we do, in video, the third part of our ministry. The first part is to obviously share, relate, and to talk about Jesus in a personal intimate way right through the avenue and the venue of the video, the video that we record, the vidivo, the devotional style of ministry that we choose to take a part of something that's devotional 
and present it emotionally to you with the relationship confident that the Holy Spirit can make it applicable to you as you choose to apply it in your life. Caring and daring to be honest and open and truthful about everything that's in front of the camera that you can see. Knowing full well that, hey, I'm just me, you know, and there's nothing special about me that I'm just a nobody sharing about somebody so that you can know him in a more intimate, personal way. And then the second part of the ministry being that relationship that we have of assembling together the materials with which you can grow thereby to be an aggregate, to be that provider, that internet provider of information that comes from ministries and from sources and from people and from the Word of God that we can provide to you in the best way that we know how of the simplicity of using the social media to present not just pictures you know that are spiritually you know motivational towards you that would inspire you to go to the Word of God or to go to God but also those things that are the actual Word of God we even do that too just post the Word of God as well as other venues of Bible studies and and video teachings audio tapes, uh, blogs, websites, and assembling together all these materials and tools with which a person can grow thereby and learn of the Lord by using them to their own profit so that they wouldn't have to go searching or wondering or deciding or trying to figure out you know, where to go, what to do, how to do, and what to be it. It's kind of like a discipleship, the second part of the video ministry. And then the third part, obviously, is from the Spirit of God, you know, the Father, Son, Spirit, is to address those things that are in error, to comment, to have intercourse, to have relationship, to have intercommunication with one another so that we would comment to each other that people who write me get answers. I mean, if a person emails me and they talk to me, hey, I talk to them. No problem there. You know, if a person chooses to just simply comment on their own post, well then yeah, I comment on that. Or if there's things going by, I comment on them. And those are the three aspects of that with which God has unified into one, sharing Jesus intimately in a personal way. And to coordinate that in such a way that every day, it takes the full day it takes a comprehensive amount of time in order to present all that God is doing. Because in all of your life, if you'll acknowledge Him, He'll direct your life. In every way that you choose today to observe what God is doing, He will choose to use you in a way that you've never dreamed of possible. That every appointment and every selective choice that you make could be directed by God both to do it to will of His good pleasure so that you would see Him in the midst of you as well as in the midst of your life, accomplishing that which you never dreamed He could have done before. And that all you need to do is to have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say to you and the faith to know that God loves you. God is with you. God will not cast you aside because He died for you. That is your assurance you can hold on to. Because God will never change. And because He said so, He'll do so. And so if God has spoken to you and told you, hey, I love you, then you have that assurance of faith, knowing full well that the day will come when you will be brought unto the completion of your salvation, which is the redemption of your soul unto Jesus in the day when we stand before Him. And we will be rewarded some people feel like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to be all busted up and you know, blown out and and kind of like, you know, chastised. Well, you know, maybe part of you might be, but you see, the rewards will outweigh anything that you feel like is in your way of having that relationship that today you could have gotten rid of out of your life because you don't need to waste time, but you could be making time in order to spend more time with Jesus today by redeeming the time and seeking to know Him more personally than you ever have before. And that's how you redeem the time. Because God will make everything fit into place if you walk in His way, His will, and His timing.